The views and opinions expressed on any program are those of the producers and or the persons appearing on the program and do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of FRC Media, Bristol Community College or the City of Fall River. And I'm CJ. And it's Thursday for the Friday show. Yes, it is. It's Thursday for the Friday show. So it's going to be interesting. Um, I, As you noticed, uh, before we started broadcasting, I was uh, reviewing some of the information that's available online and through things. And I was watching earlier the mayor speaking with uh, Keith Tebow from FRC Media in regards to why we had such a huge increase uh in numbers and he was saying that that when they first looked at it um there was about 30 and then when they came back in the morning there was 80. <laughs> so I, I guess more testing is uh doing exactly what it's supposed to be doing so it makes it, it makes it for an interesting time um yeah. I guess we we had uh, multiple deaths, which was always a tragedy. Right. Well, because what what the report for Wednesday said was it was a rough day for the numbers in Fall River. Our positive cases went up 97 to 888 confirmed COVID cases. We also had three more fatalities and now sit at 17 deaths. Our testing continues to ramp up. 5,249 in Bristol County and. 80,497 statewide. If you're going through the through hell, keep going, Churchill. Another another guy who likes quotes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, another guy who likes quotes. That's true. Uh, but uh, you just got fuzzy on the screen like I normally do. Yeah, it's it's too bad. And obviously the testing, and that's one of the things we can't we can't. You know, some people I think a, a miss. A misreading the statistics because they think it's like you know in the last couple of days we, we we've had a bunch of people running out and maybe uh, getting it but that's not true what we're doing is we're finding cases that have been uh you know asymptomatic or people have been walking around uh with this and now that we're testing a lot more people we've got actually multiple testing uh facilities now in fall river so obviously these numbers are going to go uh, they're, they're going to get larger because we're going to begin to do what we really need to do that's test as many people as we can to determine you know who's got it who doesn't have it and uh, where our baseline is yeah and you know i i was out yesterday i was at the pharmacy um walgreens on rhode island avenue and they had a big sign on their door we are not doing COVID-19 testing at this site. Go to walgreens.com slash COVID-19. So obviously now you've got Rite Aid doing testing on Stafford Road. You have Walgreens doing testing somewhere. So it's getting very um, busy with the testing. Um, you saw the governor down here on Wednesday. He was um, at Star on uh, South Main Street, at 1010 South Main Street. and he was talking about testing. He was reviewing what they're doing down on 1010 South Main Street. It's interesting that they put the testing down at 1010 South Main Street because I thought it would have been at their main facility on Stanley Street, but it, I guess not. Um, uh, probably because that. That's beyond play of the rich and the nauseous. Yeah, <laughs> probably because. I'm surprised that they had a facility at Stanley Street. So. Yeah, true. But well, remember that opened up when it was for drunk. When it was just for drugs. Now now it's for everything else. <laughs> yeah. Anything that makes money. Yeah. Um, but now I think they, the reason why they put on South Main Street is the parking lot is conducive to driving in and driving out without a major issue. Whereas Stanley Street is not conducive to that. It's you know, it's got a like a rotary type uh area at its entrance. And I, I think it would have been too uh difficult to uh actually do a uh a, a drive-through thing at, at stanley street so belly just left he said i'm tired of this <laughs> uh, yeah so he's probably 
go in and lay in a cool place now and just chill out. So. Yeah, well, that's what I'd like to do once in a while, too. <laughs> hey, um, the, the uh, Pioneer Institute, which is a public policy uh, research institute, came out with some information about unemployment in Massachusetts. And it's interesting to see how this is working out. Some of the towns that are being hit the hardest are towns that which depend on tourism and hospitality industries. And also, and that's over on the Cape, and then going on the opposite end, which is the western part of Massachusetts, they're doing the same thing. I'll give you some unemployment rates. Provincetown has a 33.8% unemployment rate. Lawrence has 32.6%. Amherst, 32.6%. Truro, 31.8%. Holyoke, thirty-one percent. South, Holyoke. yeah, Holyoke. <laughs> Southbridge, thirty-point eight percent. North Adams, thirty-point seven percent. Yarmouth, thirty-point five percent. Gardner, thirty-point one percent, and Fitchburg, thirty-point one percent. But when you break it down by the counties, I mean, you see some variances, but I mean, it's kind of consistent. Barnstable is 28%, Berkshire is 27.9%, Bristol is 25.4%, uh, Dukes County, which is Martha's Vineyard, is 26.6%, Essex is 26.4%, Franklin is 26.4%, Hamden's 27.5%, Hampshire is 27.1%, Middlesex is 23.4%, Nantucket's 27.9%, Norfolk's 23.1%, Plymouth is 24.9, Suffolk, Suffolk, which is Boston, is 26.5, and Worcester is 25.5. Just for people who may be interested, Fall River's unemployment rate is such that, I just had it a second ago. There we are. Fall River's unemployment rate is 25.5%, with total number of unemployed as of the time of this study was 3,925 people. If 3,925 people make up 25% of our working population, that, that doesn't say a whole heck of a lot about our working population, how many people out of an 88,000 community actually work. Well, that's the problem. The demographic is we have a lot of elderly, retired people who are on fixed incomes, and we have a lot of uh, uh, people who are on uh, public aid who don't work, and that's one of the problems. But you know, they say look for a silver lining in every dark cloud. So I guess we can now take solace in the fact that we're no longer at the top of the heap for an unemployment because yeah. And that, so Fall River, normally when these tourist industries, which we are not, uh, are, are going full blown, they they actually have to bring in people to work in these communities. When the Cape was going full bore, uh, they actually had people who used to go to the Cape to work in the summer, the summer employment, because there were so many jobs. I was one of those people. I mean, I remember going to work for Bradley's. Remember when Bradley's was around? Oh, yeah, yeah. A good friend of mine was actually uh, one of the bigwigs in Bradley. Uh, yeah, I went, I went to school with him, and uh, Michael Shaughnessy, I think he was uh, one of the, the big uh, guys in charge of all the New England stores. Yeah, that was a... Wasn't that a subsidiary of Stop and Shop? That was a Stop and Shop company. It was yeah. Stop and Shop, Bradley's, Perkins, and Medimart. Medimart was the pharmacy section of the Stop and Shop companies. I remember that very clearly because I worked for Bradley's, and I worked in South Yarmouth, Massachusetts. And I used to take get a, on the van at the Fall River store and drive all the way out to the Cape and drive all the way back at night. I would get home about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night and uh, we got paid good money for doing it. And we got paid for the drive as well. Uh, but I, rem and I remember because it was a, such a touristy community. And when you'd get there, you'd be constantly busy for people who were coming in, buying their goods, buying stuff for the summer. Um, but again, tourist communities get hit hard. They got hit yeah, real they, hard. They employ them, but you know, to see those kind of rates, that's even more staggering when you think about the fact that in the summer, many of those places virtually have full employment. They need people from outside the community. Right. I remember last last well spring, it wasn't I don't know if it was actually summer. I went to I went to the uh, the retirement seminar up there in High Anderson. I went out for lunch and, and uh, the the girl who waited on me, uh, of course I was going to seafood as a cake, but uh, 
Uh, she was actually a college student. Uh, we got the, we got the conversing, and she was a college student uh, who went there to work for the summer to, to, to make money. So when she, when she went back to college, so there were a lot of people from not from those communities. So uh, this is uh, this has taken a, a a tremendous impact on on the economy, and frankly, I don't know. Uh, it's going to be a very, very long time. Before, and it, even when we're back to the new normal, we, we don't know if places like Cape Cod and Maine, which is many people vacation, you know, on the on on the coast of Maine, or whether Old Orchard or Concord Beach or Old Orchard Beach, and or the other places farther north where they have shops and. Uh, I don't know if it's ever going to be the same because if you go to Maine now, what are they going to do about uh, social distancing in, in hotels and restaurants and those places that fundamentally their economies uh, in Maine in the summer, southern Maine, are really, really heavy in tourists, not only from the United States, most of the United States, but from Canada because they have tons of Canadian uh, tourists down in, in in southern Maine. So this is a, you know, this is a very, it's going to be a very difficult time. And you know, everybody is talking. I, I just saw this morning on on the local news that uh, Ramondo was now saying that they have an eight hundred million dollar deficit in the state of Rhode Island. Of course, they're attributing everything to the coronavirus. But remember, we were there first. We had a four point seven million dollar deficit before they were <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Can't, we cannot forget that. We have to remember to hold our politicians' feet to the fire because, you know, I love it when, with, with the rhetoric. They're all great with rhetoric. Uh, I, I saw a, I saw a, uh, a legislator at a federal level uh, reaching out to people and saying, well, this is not a red state or a blue state issue. This is an American issue. Yet that's the same guy that voted for the bill to give illegals who don't even belong in this country the stimulus package while people are going without money, businesses are caving, and they're more worried about people who don't even belong in this country than they are for, for our own citizens. So, you, you know something, Congressman? You're right. This is an American issue. So let's take care of the Americans. Right, exactly. I got with it because I'm not real happy when I see stuff like this. Well, well, you know, we're, people are all upset about, you know, the stay-at-home orders, and they want to lift these stay-at-home orders, and they want to get back to the economy. Well, they could be, you know, they could maybe go, maybe they should file a, a case with the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court. In a 4-3 decision, the Wisconsin Supreme Court on Wednesday struck down the state stay-at-home order, handing Democratic Governor Tony Evans, Evers, a defeat in his administration's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Republicans and some business owners cheered the ruling as a win for liberty, while local officials in Dane County and Milwaukee immediately announced they would be enforcing the state's rules at the local level, creating a de facto regional approach to a, combating the spread of the disease. So even in, other, uh, even in other states, there's problems with this. People want to go back to work, but they don't care how they go back to work. And... Last night I was watching Nova. I mean, you you know that you know that you're bored and you you know you you're tired when all of a sudden you're watching public broadcasting. <laughs> but it was on decoding COVID nineteen. It was a very good um, hour long program. If you get a chance to watch it, I think Friday it's on at three o'clock in the afternoon on Channel thirty six. I watched it on Channel fifty three out of uh, Connecticut, but. They were saying how when we start opening up the economy, we have to do it carefully. And that what's going to happen is what we thought was normal back then is not going to be normal now. When you look at amusement parks right now, they're already planning to reopen. And the way they're going to do that is you have to make an, a, a reservation for a specific time to show up at the park and be admitted to the park. And I think that's going to happen in all the amusement parks where you're going to be making uh, reservations, you're going to go, and you're not going to be waiting in lines to get on attractions. What you're going to be doing is getting a pager or something that's going to buzz you when it's your turn to go on the attraction. 
and I, I think you're going to see that in the restaurants. I think you're going to see that um, in, you know, even in the, the concession areas. It's going to be very difficult to get back to work the way we should. And people are going to be interesting. I mean, I'm getting used to now having doctor's appointments on the phone, you know, or on the computer. And is that going to be the new way? I mean, just look at what Twitter did. Twitter said that they doesn't they don't want their employees to ever come back. They want them to work from home forever. This is the change that we're going to have, be having in this thing. And one of the big things that I don't think Fall River is preparing for, and I could be wrong, Dr. Fauci, who is a very knowledgeable man, he's been with the NIH for a very long time, uh, and he was the go-to guy on COVID for the longest time, said that we may not be able to reopen schools in September. If we're not able to reopen schools in September, what are our parents going to do with our children? That's going to create a major substance, substantial problem for these children. We're not going to be able to support being running uh, lunches out to the community every day like we've been doing since March. We're not going to be able to support having teachers teach remotely all the time. And how are we going to keep track of these kids? These kids need socialization. Where's the money going to come from? Well, you know, I actually saw some commentary on this because there's already things being uh, just, you know, banded around um, because I saw uh, one, one program where we were discussing this saying, Many, many people should think about withdrawing their, their, their children from these high-priced institutions and just sending them to an online community college because why do you want to pay uh, $100,000 to go to Harvard and be taking classes in your bedroom? Exactly, exactly. You know, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a factor. I mean, these colleges, are they going to give them? What are they going to do? Are they going to begin to give these classes at a discount rate? They're going to charge their tu their, their astronomical tuitions. Uh, are you and and people go to Harvard or or any Ivy League school or any other prestigious school, whether it's MIT, because that name carries weight once you get out of those schools to get to get a degree. And they can say what they want, but the reality is a degree from certain institutions when you're interviewing for a position is held in higher esteem. Whether it's justified or not, it, it depends on your own personal opinion on that. But the reality is that they are. Uh, when you have a degree from an Ivy League school, it, it, it's looked upon in a different light. It, but are people going to actually pay? these tuitions for their kids to be home, fundamentally homeschooled, no, not, being, not being in a classroom with their peers or with their professors and, and, and well, as they say, uh, getting the college experience, which to me, maybe this should be the norm because uh, I, I guess the college experience, if you take away the actual learning, which you can do online, is what? Joining a frat, getting drunk and partying? For a lot of people, not, that's what it is. Not sure. Going to the football games, you know, and, and, and getting drunk, getting high. Well, while we're on high, uh, you were talking about uh, P-Town and, and the Cape and the tourism. Did, did you happen to see the first episode of that new series, High Town, which is about Provincetown? No, I haven't seen it. Neither have I. I'm, I have to watch it. It's, it's available free. Uh, it's about, I guess, the, the you know, about the... Uh, well, we we saw the I think it was I believe it was an H, HBO documentary about the uh, the drug problem in the Cape, and they have a they had a tremendous drug problem. You'd never know it because they cover it up well. Right. And they did a documentary, and apparently, P Town's got a you know tremendous drug culture there too. And I think I believe that's what this series uh, basically addresses. So, but you know, th there are all kinds of stuff like you know there are all kinds of, of ancillary issues with with this that we look at, and college is a big thing. I mean, as I said, are they going to charge sixty, seventy, eighty thousand dollars tuition for somebody to, to, to be distance learning like you and I are having this show today? They're going to have somebody doing it the way they're doing it now. It, this may actually change the entire course of education. Right, it will. It definitely will. And by the way, that program, Hightown, it premieres on Sunday 
at 8 p.m. on Stars. Okay, good thing I didn't watch it because it's not on yet. No, it's it's on Stars, and it's going to be premiering Sunday at 8 p.m. So. Okay, well, like I said, it's a good thing I didn't try to watch it because it wasn't on yet. But I did see the thing that it, they're they're making it available to people who don't have Stars. Right. So if you have, so if you have cable, you you can watch the first episodes because it's a obviously it's a hook to try to get you to watch. But you know uh, we are we got 15 minutes, but I guess we we've, we've got, got less to, than that now. <laughs> We gotta, yeah, we gotta get a little, you know. We talked about, you know, city business, and you know, we've talked about, uh, we 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 talked about that. Or you talked about that ordinance meeting and stuff, but you know, we we see a lot of talk, and you know, we we talk about the what goes on in this city, and we talk about how they 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 seemingly have a total disregard uh, for the benefit of people, and we see a lot of things that we consider a waste and uh, I was going I was doing paperwork so nice when you call me I thought I was sorting a lot of paperwork and, and, and this is you know we always talk about fiduciary duty but I think I, I came across this definition that I used once in a presentation and I believe it came from Black's Law Dictionary and I think it's really important that our city council and our financial team and our mayor and everybody listen to this because I think in the in the not too distant future, there may be some some complaints filed because of the uh, lack of adherence to their fiduciary. Because they are fiduciaries, they are fiduciaries because they are using our tax money. Right. And this is the, this is the definition from from Black's Law: a fiduciary duty is a legal duty to act solely in another party's interest, and we are those parties. Parties owing this uh, owing this duty are called fiduciaries. So anybody that works for us, like the retirement board, I am a fiduciary for the retirement system. Uh, so parties owing this duty are called fiduciaries. The individuals to whom they owe a duty are called principals. We, the citizens and taxpayers of Fall River, are the principals. Fiduciaries may not profit from their relationship with their principles unless they have the principles expressed informed consent. They also have a duty to avoid, this is very important right now, and we'll see in the not too distant future. They also have a duty to, to avoid any conflict of interest between themselves and their principles or between their principles and the fiduciaries other clients. A fiduciary duty, this is really important, a fiduciary duty is the strictest duty of care recognized by the United States legal system. I know where you're going with that. You know that, right? <laughs> I'm going in. Yeah, I'm, 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 just, I'm, just, I'm just planting the planting the seed so when we discuss some some uh, lacks of uh, some old, total lack of fiduciary responsibility and complaints about people who know why we're doing it because they are legally bound to do this. Just well, I'll tell you, yesterday my phone was ringing off the hook and I got more information in one hour than I had gotten in, you know, three months about things going on in the city, about people who are in line to get a job when somebody retires why they're doing what they're doing. I got phone calls about this rolling memorial where, you know, the governor still has a, a, a ban on having more than 10 people. This rolling memorial is going to have more than 10 people gathered. People are going to gather to see this. And the people who are putting that together are Bill Damaris and Chuck Gregory. And they will not, will not, will not, will not put it aside. They do not care about the people. They only care about putting their name out there and putting out their memorial, rolling memorial tribute. I'm all for veterans. I'm all for supporting veterans. I'm all for honoring veterans. But, you know, everything in this state has been shut down until the end of the year, just about. No parades, no fireworks, no Fourth of July fireworks this year. No parades, no gatherings, no beaches, no parks. But, Bill Damaris and Chuck Gregory are very special. They can have a parade. 
That's wrong. And our mayor is not doing anything about it. He's refusing to do anything about it at this point. And that's a problem. And this is the type of thing that he's showing. And people are doing this to make themselves look good. Yeah, well, the patronage, the patronage train continues to chug along. Nepotism and patronage is beginning to run rampant. As you said, we're getting a lot of information now. And if we remember, we go back to number one, fiduciary duty. Uh, Mary Sahadi had a fiduciary duty to give the accurate numbers to the city council, not say 8% in health care. And she left out the only the only part that really is a, is a solid figure. And if you watch the PEC meeting, she never uttered a word that it was 5.7. So there's a, there's a fiduciary, there, there's a breach of her fiduciary legal obligation. And we can go on. The, late, there's the latest appointment from, as you said, we're, we're beginning to put all the pieces together. The latest appointment. Somebody from Barrington, who's a doctor's son, who's also friendly with another power player, a big money man in the city of Fall River. So they get these jobs in Fall River, and the hell, you know, the hell of the charter. We have no one in Fall River that can assume that job. So we've had one from Seekonk, one from Barrington, nobody from Fall River, and I believe the Seekonk one was an entry level position. Right. You're going to tell me we have absolutely no one in the city of Fall River that can take an entry level job, and we know who she was recommended over because we went over it on the show. Right. So it's always a political and and I tell you, you as you said, you get phone calls. I get phone calls all the time because I get phone calls about well, you know, uh, everybody that doesn't take a test for their job, fundamentally in this city has to be recommended by a politician. That's right. So once they get a job, regardless of how incompetent they are, and, and regardless of how effective an employee they are, they stay on the job. Exactly, exactly, and exactly. Nine percent of the cases. And this is why we have the problems we have. And again, they talk even on a national level about the deficit in firefighters and police. Every time, and this, you know, we're not talking from theory. This is fact. We've seen, we've seen economic, you know, problems that 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 put us in a, a, a serious condition numerous times throughout our life. And I know, CJ, you have, and I have. We've seen this city in in the throes of financial problems. And can you ever remember when they ever cut out a couple of department heads or reduced the pay of the department heads or done anything? It's always fire, police, schools, the teachers, not the, not the, not the, uh, the administrators in a, in a middle school, not the CFO, not the treasurer for the school department. And why the, I still say, why does the school department have a treasurer when we have a city treasurer and a city auditor? And they're responsible for the entire city of Fall River, of which the school department is part of. But no, they had to create a six figure a couple of six figure jobs. They also have they also have as I said, they also have a maintenance department. Even though by city ordinance, DCM is responsible for maintenance on all city buildings. And that does not say exclusive of school buildings. Right, right. So you want to know where your taxpayer money is being waste, wasted? It's on the people who have the automatic pay raises and get the $40,000 the, the $40, pay raises and the $20,000 pay raises and have $10,000 stipends. I hear you. I hear you. Not the, not the poor slob that's working in City Hall collecting your water bill for, for $28,000 or $32,000 a year. That's not the problem in this city. The problem in a city that we forgot, and we've allowed them to create, to, to evolve this city into a into an absolute poster child for nepotism and patronage. Well, that's that's what the Fall River motto is. You know, come work for us if you're a political connected person. Well, it looks like we're out of time, so let's wrap this up. You know, keep watching us, people. We're going to be bring, breaking some big news. Chips got out his, his swatter, swat away that those tax dollars. <laughs> Slowly they turn it, and then whack all taxpayer. 
There you go. Hey, thanks for watching. Stay safe, and we'll see you on Monday.